Daytona. First round in the 1970 World Sports Car Championship. Two works-backed Porsche 917s in the Gulf Oil colours for the first time. The opposition includes a rival 917 from the Salzburg team and a powerful lineup of Ferraris returning from exile, self-imposed in protest against new prototype regulations. Daytona went extremely well with a very convincing win for our Porsches. They dominated the race, led for the entire distance. Superficially, it was a textbook exercise, but I think we all felt that we were very much on trial. It was very important that we made no mistakes, and we were all very relieved when it turned out well. Rodriguez and Kinnanen come through without a hitch, and, thanks to a well-prepared car, impeccable pitwork and superb driving, break the Daytona distance record by a fantastic 372 miles. Behind the scenes at Daytona, there were one or two bad moments. For example, when the clutch failed in Siffert's car, and we decided to withdraw the car and wheeled it away behind the pits. And uh, then the Porsche engineers pointed out that the clutch could be changed in an hour and a quarter. And at that stage of the race, with all the Ferraris in trouble, the car could still be second. So we brought the car back, and uh, in the event, from the time we started, we changed the clutch in 50 minutes and got back to the race. Daytona is a very short circuit with a lap time of well under two minutes. So it's very difficult in a 24-hour race to keep track of all the cars. We were pretty happy about our first car because it was leading by about 190 miles, but we weren't exactly sure whether our second car was in front of Mario Andretti or behind him. So to play safe, we signaled to Siffert that he was behind, and this was when he put on his great charge in the last half hour, which was the high spot of the race. In fact, it was completely unnecessary because he was in front all the time. I always try to win, but when I don't win, I'm content with second place, or third, or fourth. Like at Daytona, where I was second, but it gave me as much satisfaction as winning. Daytona was a good win for me, and important, because it was the first race with a new team. Winning gave me a confidence on the car, and in the team supporting it. I think because I won, it gave them encouragement too. I don't think that the the first race in 1970 was any more significant than the first race in any other year from the purely motor racing aspect. Uh, but it was obviously going to be an interesting exercise in international relations. Uh, Porsche, who had won the world championship in 1969, were going to be under British management with the support of Gulf Oil in the United States. Uh, my company, JW Automotive Engineering, had provided the um, principal competition to Porsche in 1968 and 1969, but it remained to be seen uh, if this combination of our management, Porsche engineering, and Gulf Oil could be forged into a winning team. Next, Sebring. The Gulf team enter with a 1-2 victory behind them. Already, Porsche have a four-point lead over Ferrari in the championship. Sebring was a setback. We lost in rather unusual circumstances. Porsche gave us redesigned front hubs, which we fitted for the race, and then the night before the race, they changed their minds and tried to get in touch with their engineer on the spot in Sebring. And mainly because of the time difference between Germany and the United States, by the time the message got through to us, it was too late to change. All the front hubs broke on both cars. We changed the first hub on Sippert's car in 30 minutes, the first hub on Pedro's car in 15 minutes, and the second hub on Pedro's car in nine minutes. We were getting pretty good at changing hubs, but not good enough. If this had happened in our first race, it would have been very depressing, but we often learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. Above all, Sebring was a breakdown in communications between Porsche and ourselves, and it was a problem we never had again.
Always challenging the leaders at Sebring, and with one foot in plaster, actor Steve McQueen drives a golf-backed Porsche 908. McQueen takes second place. Rodriguez and Kinnanen are fourth for golf and John Wyatt. But finally, it's a well-deserved win for Mario Andretti and Ferrari's first major sports car success for almost three years. Nine championship points for Ferrari, six for Porsche. After failure at Sebring, John Wire's team look for success at Brands Hatch. British weather dampens the track but not spirits and Pedro Rodriguez sums up their advantages. It is good to be in a golf team because we have a good cars and a good management. And the cars always will be well prepared for the race. And during the race, the pits will be always ready and fast and efficient, so we don't lose much time. Brands Hatch was very successful and went a long way to restoring our morale after Sebring. I think it will chiefly be remembered for the appalling weather and for Rodriguez's virtuoso performance. The circumstances were a bit unusual because there was a very bad shunt on the first lap and the yellow flag was out for several laps for no passing. And Pedro didn't see the yellow flag because of the rain and he passed several cars. And then he was black flagged and brought in. again, he ran away and hid from the entire field. He outdrove even Siffer. I think that on that day, in those conditions, he was completely unbeatable. It was a personal triumph. At France Hash, before the black flag, I was running second. After, I was 12. So I had to drive very hard, as if the track were dry. I went through the field and took the lead, and I lost it when we changed drivers. I took it back again and went on to win by five laps. Racing drivers are inevitably strongly individual personalities. If they were the sort of people who did what they were told from nine to five, they wouldn't be racing drivers, or they wouldn't be any good. They are the highest exponents of one of the most difficult and dangerous arts in the world. And it's no good expecting them to behave like members of the school's second 11. It is our business to make use of their abilities and not fight against them. We expect them to be competitive, and we have no time for good losers. I like fast cars. I like the competition. You must like all that is involved in motor racing because it is a hard sport. When I am driving, I must pass all cars. Ferrari or Porsche of my own team, it's all the same. I must pass, even if the chief of the team is not always happy. I was motorcycle champion of Mexico before I was 15, and I started racing cars when I was 15. And I was again champion of Mexico at 17. And not until I was 17, I started racing international. Sapi Siffert is a natural charger. His one idea of motor racing is to get in front and stay there. If there's a car in front, Sepi has to pass it if he can. This really causes us no problem because it's desirable to have one driver of this type in the team and in the shorter races it may be essential. In the longer races he may sometimes drive harder than is strictly necessary but he doesn't ask more from the car than it should be able to stand. It is good to be part of a strong team. It makes you drive faster still. Pedro Rodriguez is by preference a more calculating type of driver. He likes to sit back in the early stages and watch the race develop before he stages his attack, which he does with an exquisite sense of timing. He has great mechanical sympathy and he's very kind to the car, what I suppose horsey people call good hands. He's also capable of changing roles. 
um, either when roused as a Brands Hatch or Watkins Glen, or when necessary as at Monza. He's a complete professional. I like to have strong drivers in my team and race against strong drivers like X, Mario Andretti, and Baccarella because they make me go faster still. Golf Porsches first and second, two other Porsches third and fourth. Nine championship points for Porsche, only two for Ferrari. Italy next, the thousand kilometers of Monza. Heartened by sunshine and success, the golf team enter in high good humor. Monza was a very interesting race. Uh, Pedro won again for golf, but uh, all Ferraris went well and all finished, and we had to work really hard. Our pit work was always a bit better than Ferrari, so they had to go faster and faster in order to get further and further behind, which must have been rather demoralizing for them. Uh, another interesting thing was that Sippert spun and crashed after 11 laps, so Pedro had to take over Sippert's role as pacemaker, which he did extremely well and built up a considerable lead. When Kinnunen took over, he lost most of it, so Pedro had to do the whole job a second time. At Monza, I was running with the four and a half liter engine against all the five liter Ferraris. It was very difficult to keep up with them. And because of that, I was making a very hard race. I made an average speed over 144 miles an hour, and I won the race. But Ferrari came in second, third, and fourth, and it was a very tough one. At Monza, golf first again. But next, the arduous Targa Floria. And in Sicily, home ground for Ferrari driver Nino Vaccarella. Porsche produced the 908 Mark III, which was much better suited to the circuit than the big 917. And because the cars were strange to us, this was really a Porsche show with my team in support. Pedro Rodriguez was ill, and uh, so Kinnan took over as number one driver in their car, and he did a tremendous job. He made fastest lap, and the car finished second. The Targa Flare, of course, is a unique circuit. It's 44 miles round and very difficult to learn. In some respects, it's more like a rally than a race. And, of course, the suited Kinnunen, who is a rally driver. He put the car into the lead at the start and lost it when Pedro was driving, which was a reversal of the situation at Monza. And then, by his very great effort and fastest lap, got back into second place at the finish. The Targa Flaria is really a race against the clock. The cars do not all start at the same time, so a car which starts ten minutes behind you and passes the pits apparently nine minutes behind you is actually a minute in front of you. And by the time you've worked out all the sums and radioed the signal through to the signal base up in the mountains, the car may have passed the signal base. And the driver has to wait until he gets back to the pits, a delay of 40 minutes, before he receives the signal, which by that time may be out of date. Because of this signaling problem, Siffert was on the third lap and taking things fairly easily before he realized that the cars which were behind him on the road were actually in front of him. And it was not until seven out of the 11 laps that um, the Siffert Redmond car actually went into the lead. Uh, they drove a tremendous race and thoroughly deserved to win. 
Ma meilleure course en 1970. For me, the best event in 1970 was victory in the Targa Florio. It is a very long track measuring more than 70 kilometers. And there are about 700 bands that makes it very, very difficult. Which suits me very well. Finally, there is some consolation for the Sicilians. Their hero, Vaccarella, takes third place. But again, Siffert and Rodriguez take first and second for golf. Two other Porsches are fourth and fifth. In the championship charts, Porsches have 42 points to Ferrari's 25. Next, Spa in Belgium, with starting conditions much like those at Brands Hatch, and last minute tyre changes to match the changeable weather. From the start, the Gulf Porsches are pressed hard by the X and Surtees Ferraris. Eventually, the Rodriguez Kinnanen 917 is forced to retire with mechanical trouble, leaving only Siffert to battle with the leading Ferrari. In the middle of it all, the local Ferrari, driven by De Fierland and Derek Bell, catches fire, yet still goes on to take eighth place. The JW team are at their best under pressure, and in the end, the honours go to Siffert and Redmond in first place for golf. Again, nine more championship points for Porsche, six for Ferrari. Spa was a good and fairly comfortable win for Siffert and Redmond, who broke the record for the thousand kilometres. Pedro retired, but before he retired, he did this fantastic 160 mile an hour lap, which was an absolute record for the circuit. After success at Spa, Nürburgring. A disappointment for Gulf with no finishes at all, although Pedro Rodriguez makes fastest lap. Salzburg Porsches take first and second places with a Ferrari third. With the points already earned by Gulf cars, the Salzburg win clinches the championship for Porsche, and the JW team are already looking forward to Le Mans for their next win. Le Mans was a complete disaster. Certainly our worst race and a tremendous disappointment. But if the race were to be run over again, I can't think of anything which we would have done differently. Uh, Pedro and Leo Kinnanen were our main hope. It's the sort of race that Pedro likes, and Leo would have given him adequate support. But Pedro's engine blew quite early in the race for no good reason. And then we had the Mike Hill with us. Mike came in for a fuel stop and we had the opportunity to change to rain tyres. 
But it had only just started raining, and he said that he was quite happy to continue on intermediate towers. And immediately he went out again. There was a complete cloudburst, and on the next lap he crashed. Well, this left us with only the Siffert Redmond car, going well and leading by seven laps at midnight. Uh, all the Ferraris were out, and there was no pressure. But at 2 a.m., 10 hours after the start, Siffert missed a gear and blew his engine. And then we had no cars at all. And reality for the Watkins Glen six-hour race after the 48 hours of Le Mans. After three laps, Siffert takes the lead from Mario Andretti's Ferrari. Then Andretti loses second place to Pedro Rodriguez, and Ferrari's chances of repeating their Sebring win dwindle. It was during this race, when Pedro was coming up to lap Siffert, that, that the two cars touched. And a lot was made of this incident by the press, but really there was no question of the two of them fighting for the lead, because actually they were a lap apart at the time. Siffert was passing a slower car, and I very much doubt if he knew that Pedro was there. The most interesting thing about the race was um, another incident which brought out the best in Pedro. When, quite early in the race, when he was starting to catch the slower cars, he um, tried to switch on his headlights, and uh, instead, by mistake, he switched off the fuel pumps, and the engine started to die. He was just about to come into the pits when he realized what he'd done and uh, switched the pumps on again. And this really got his adrenaline going. He passed the entire field, including Andretti and Siffert, and went away into about a lap lead. I think that uh, Watkins Glen was probably our best race in 1970. We had no problems, and our cars were first and second on the same lap. Pedro and Kinnan and won, with Siffert and Redmond second, and Pedro made fastest lap. Next, the non-championship Can-Am on the Watkins Glen track. An interesting exercise before the last championship race of the 1970 season. The Porsche 917 is not really a suitable car for the Can-Am, but we entered because we were there anyway, and to make the drivers happy. The drivers like the Can-Am because the races are short and there's a lot of money to be won. We entered the cars which had been first and second the day before for Siffert and Rodriguez and the practice car for Redmond. In the event, our cars proved to be surprisingly competitive in spite of the fact that we had to stop to refuel and of course the Can-Am cars go right through without stopping. We refueled Siffert in 21 seconds and after that with 10 laps to go, he got back to within 10 seconds of any Hume, and we were even in some danger of winning the race. Pedro missed a gear and blew his engine, and Redmond drove a very good race, but uh, was delayed by a puncture and finished seventh. Then Siffert got pushed off the line by a slower car and went off the road and motored over half New York State before he got back on again, and still finished a good second. Siffert second for Gulf and John Wyatt. Denny Hume wins for Gulf in a McLaren. 
Finally, the last championship race of the season in Austria, the Zelfeg 1,000 kilometers. A lot happens to round off the year, despite the end of term atmosphere at the start, presided over by none other than Juan Fangio. I suppose the most interesting thing about Zoltberg was that for the first time in 1970 we did not have superiority in performance. The Ferrari, driven by Jackie X, was tremendously fast and after Pedro had retired on the fifth lap with a blown engine, we were really very much on the defensive. We only got into the lead after the Ferrari had retired and the leading Salzburg Porsche had run out of fuel. And in these very adverse circumstances it was satisfying for us that the um, organization continued to work efficiently and smoothly and we were able to win the race with a very sick car running on 11 cylinders. For most of the day, the mist lies in the hollows of the Zeltweg mountain circuit with the sun shining brilliantly elsewhere. The last championship race of the season proves as unpredictable as the first. Siffert's 917 leads from a 3-litre Alpha, and there are more Porsche 908s among the leaders than either 917s or Ferraris. As if to even things up a bit, Siffert's car is running with reduced power, and he has to rely on the support team at the pits to maintain his position. It is not enough to have a fast car and to drive fast. You must have a strong team in the pits, like John Wiles. A team of mechanics who work fast. Otherwise you can lose in the pits all the seconds you have gained on the track. With only nine laps to go, the Alpha is gaining 15 seconds a lap. Not enough to catch up and win if the Gulf Porsche keeps going, but enough to worry John Wire's team in case it doesn't. Just two laps from the end, it's the Alpha, not the Porsche, that fails and trickles into the pit with electrical trouble. A flurry of half-hearted activity in support of a lost cause is too late to get the car back into the race. But without having to leave the pits again, the Alpha takes second place on distance already covered. A well-deserved win for Siffert and a fitting end to a remarkable year for the Gulf Porsche team, with seven wins out of ten championship races.
Despite the close run with the Alfa at Zalfeg, Ferrari remained the chief challenge to the Gulf and Salzburg Porsches throughout the year. John Wire remembers it well. Ferrari is always a formidable opponent. I think that a good axiom for motor racing might be never underrate Ferrari. They made a slightly uncertain start in 1970. The cars weren't very reliable and um, the organization was a bit shaky at times. But they improved steadily throughout the season, both in performance and reliability. And by the end of the season, they had reached something very close to parity, certainly in performance. I think that uh, 1971 could be still more interesting because Porsche haven't been standing still and we expect our cars to be better than they were in 1970. And it's the last year of the present formula, the last year in which we can use these big cars. In 1972, we all have to come down to three litres, and I think that the competition may then be even more intense than it is now. 